Great. Welcome to July Set News. My name is Rob, and today we've got a lot of things to go over. Uh, first of all, as the thumbnail and title suggests, I think this new report from the White House is actually good, and we're going to talk about exactly why that is, even though it calls for a potential ban on proof of work, which would also furnish be Bitcoin. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about uh, the sharp ratio for risk assessment, interview with uh, Alan Sokolitsky from Masterworks, and lastly, we'll do the NFT giveaway, which I promised uh, a couple of days ago, which I missed, for ladies and these, and we'll do that at the very end. And then of course, at the very, very end, do a little Q and A. So first things first, let's talk about this report. And I was really excited about this report. And I think it was part of the reason why there was a pump in the price of crypto. There's a couple of other factors. There's never one specific thing. I know people were pretty worried about the report itself and they uh, made a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk about it. But when I take a look at it, I go, I think this makes sense and we're moving in the right direction. So the first things first, uh, if you haven't watched Charles Hoskinson's response to this, it's classic. It's great. Uh, Charles never disappoints. You should follow him on his channel. Great stuff as he talked about the report, <laughs> the report itself. It was really good. And I was going to put out this video yesterday, but I had to be with uh, the guys over there at DCA. It was uh, me, Ben and James, and we talked about everything from what's going on as far as uh, inflation, Europe, where we see Bitcoin going. It's a pretty good Pretty good uh, uh, 50 minutes long interview we went over. Links in the description. But this is what it all comes down to. This report, actually, excuse me, this report right here. Climate and energy implications of crypto assets in the US. I'm not going to go through it. Thankfully, CryptoSlate.com did most of the hard work for me. And they pretty much just gave us uh, the best information from the report about what's going on. So this was a report titled Climate and Energy Implications. And the White House called for standards like miners using clean energy and the need for low energy intensities. This is a result of President Biden's executive order on crypto earlier this week. And remember, this was like a big news. Like there was a, a council, President Joe Biden said, hey, we should take a look at what's going on with uh, crypto and, and assess if it's actually going to be good or not. And uh, after so many months, this was the report that we got. And uh, opinions vary. This is just my opinion. I could be way off. I could be super wrong, but this is just the way things that I see. But this is the basics of it. So the report took a step further by recommending a possible limit or ban on crypto mining if the measures don't prevent the negative impacts of crypto mining. Uh, of course, what they're talking about here is the uh, massive amount of energy use. Some may dispute the word of uh, the adjective of massive, but uh, it does use a lot of uh, energy. Let's just be honest. So it states this, should these measures prove ineffective at reducing impacts, the administration should explore executive actions and Congress might consider legislation to limit or eliminate the use of high energy intensity consensus mechanisms, proof of work, for crypto asset mining, Bitcoin. So that's pretty much where, where they went with this report. And I know I can understand why people dig a this and go, that's pretty awful. Just wait, we'll get in all this stuff about why it's not a big thing. So the report also highlighted the high energy consumption of crypto mining. Uh, it did state though about 0.3% of global annual greenhouse gas emissions. 0.3%, not too bad, I don't think. The White House also wants electricity grid operators to ensure crypto mining doesn't affect grid stability. We're already doing that in, in Texas. I'll talk about that in a second. And then it talks about innovation. And I think this is where, I think this was part was missed a little bit and people kind of glanced over it. This is, all, this is what they always wanted. This is all ESG compliance. This is moving away from fossil fuels. This is going into innovation. And I think that's what it is. And I know people, I'm gonna take a very unpopular opinion. But I think this is where we should be going. Not for, not for uh, ESG compliance, but just for a little bit of regulation, just to show us or to lay it down, like give us the rules so I know what the rules are so I can play the game and I can bend the rules to my whim. So this is what it states. The report acknowledges innovations on the parts of miners and mentions miners that use flared and vented methane for their machines and how this is positive for the climate. If you don't know, for oils, oil rigs, when they do these to, to blow these off, uh, this is just waste and uh, it is not conducive to the environment. However, if you can harness that and use that for electrical capacity, especially for Bitcoin mining, that's a positive. And that's what they said. If they can use that and it doesn't uh, disrupt the grid, so much the better. And it said miners could volunteer or be required to build zero carbon energy capacity that produces more electricity 
than their crypto mining facility requires. What does that mean? I'll get into that. So here's what it comes down to. There's a couple of reasons why they're not gonna ban Bitcoin. And I'd like to say that this isn't the primary reason, but I think it is what the primary reason is. And it comes down to this. Uh, they're making a lot of money. And this is Ted Cruz from the great state of Texas where I'm living right now. We're actually vacationing in. And it states Ted Cruz is going to, is going to bat for crypto in the U.S. This is just on September 2nd. If you don't know, uh, Ted Cruz is a big proponent of uh, crypto and, and the Bitcoin mining operation. You know why? It brings money to the state. It also brings a lot of jobs. And when you're running for Senate, those are two good things, especially in this junk uh, economy that we're going through. So if we can do that, so much the better. Now, nobody really likes uh, sky-high electricity prices. But we'll get into that in a second. He did state, I am proud to lead the fight of the crypto industry in the Senate. Texas will continue to be the center for crypto innovation. And also, if you take a look at the bigger picture, the United States is crushing it as far as for Bitcoin mining operation. This is a great chart. Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index. We're going to take a look at two different things. First of all, the visualization of the Bitcoin mining map globally. And we're going to start here in August 2019. And you can see that uh, as far as the concentration of Bitcoin miners, the darker, I guess this orangey would be, is the more concentrated of the Bitcoin miners. In August 2019, not too long ago, China had 75%. I know people didn't want to say that, but it was true. 75%. Russia, 5%, 6%. America, kind of laggards, 4%. Now just watch this as we go through, and you can see that the prices, or not the prices, the actual uh, con concentration of Bitcoin miners are changing a little bit, a little bit, but right around, oh, here. Look at that. From May 2021 to June 2021, what happened? Well, that was China's mistake because they banned Bitcoin miners. Now, there's still some Bitcoin mining going on in the background. Uh, we know that is to be true. But right now, look where we're at. 35% as far as the hash rate, as far as June 2021. If we go forward, you can see a little bit more happens in China, illegally, I might add, but that's whatever they want to do. And the last one they have is December 2021, and we're staying at almost 40% of the global hash rate in 2021. America doesn't want to lose this. There's an electricity, there's a, there's a war going on between tech, innovation, and AI. And make no mistake, it's between U.S. and China and a couple other different countries. If they want to do away with it, so much the better. And then if we kind of drill down in different uh, states, if we really wanted to, you know that Georgia produces 30% of the hash rate share of the U.S.? 30%. Texas, 11. Kentucky, 10. And New York, 9.8%. And then remember when I talked about as far as the grid stability? Well, guess what? In this state, Texas and a lot of other states, they, they do what everybody does, I think is they shut down. We just had a massive, a massive amount of, uh, of climate, not climate change, but an increase in the temperature, uh, 100 degree days for uh, well over 30 days. And that put a big tax on the electrical power grid. So what did they do? They said, hey, Bitcoin miners shut down. And they said, fine, we will do that. Not only that, they paid them to shut them down so they could stabilize the power grid. And uh, to really delve into that, and I think this is exactly what that report talked about as far as uh, grid stability. So if we can do that, okay. So this was an article, Bloomberg, Bitcoin miner shut as Texas power grid increases, demand increases. This is uh, from July 11th, 2022. So miners such as Riot, Argo, and Core Scientific have come to the Lone Star State thanks to its low energy costs and liberal re regulations on crypto mining. The city has become one of the largest crypto mining hubs by computing power in the world. And I will just say this, because our electricity is so cheap and we've only gone up a little bit, and a lot of European countries, from, and correct me where I'm wrong here in the comments section, but a lot of the Bitcoin miners have, uh, have shut down because it's just too darn expensive. So if we take a look at it, well, what's gonna happen? Well, they're gonna have to shut down. The difficulty is going to drop. And then the people that I actually keep the, the rigs on, unfortunately, that's good, or fortunately in America, that's gonna, what's going to happen. 
and we're going to do a lot of that Bitcoin mining. Now, I don't think that uh, America wants to lose that competitive advantage, but maybe I'm wrong. But this part kind of sums it up. There are over 1,000 megawatts worth of Bitcoin mining load that respond to ERCOT's conservation requests by turning off their machines to conserve energy for the grid. This is Lee Bratcher, president of Texas Blockchain Council. This represents nearly all industrial-scale Bitcoin mining load in Texas and allows for over 1% of total grid capacity to be pushed back onto the grid for retail and commercial use. 1%. So up to this point, it's sounding pretty good. And I'm making a pretty rosy case for Bitcoin, let's be honest. But I, am, I must be transparent with you. I own Bitcoin. Everything I talk about in this, on this channel, I'm super biased. But I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm just not. And there are some, power, there are some problems out there that we can definitely see. So especially with what this report or this article also talks about down here. So don't get too happy, Bitcoin maxis. While Texas is likely to face more energy shortages in the future, Aircut expects crypto miners to increase electricity demand by up to six gigawatts by mid-2023. That's more than enough to power every home in Houston. I got to tell you, if we keep going on that route, it kind of seems a little unsustainable. Am I wrong? I mean, it seems like, and of course people say, well, it's, a, it's an economic revolution. We should put as much electricity power that we possibly can into Bitcoin. Here's the thing. Some places can do that, and I think you can drop off, but I don't think there's going to be Bitcoin mining globally if we still see these, uh, these massive increase in prices. Uh, people in the comment section tell me all the time about how European nations are going, you know, five, seven, eight, 10x of uh, natural gas, electricity is going through the roof, and of course, winter's coming up. So I just don't see how we can keep those miners in operation. Now, we can still, we can still keep miners in operation, but I don't know what's going to be uh, globally. And then also, if we take a look at uh, the Cambridge report for comparisons as far as uh, production of energy, which I link this in the comments or in the descriptions, so you can check it out for yourself. Uh, you know, Bitcoin for terawatt hours per year, 94. It's a lot, but gold is 131. Do we need a lot of that gold mining? I'm just asking because everybody asks me about Bitcoin mining. So I got to ask the question, do we really need that much gold mining? Copper is 167. Bitcoin down here is 95. Data networks, 250. Paper and pulp. 586, iron and steel, 1233. I can see that. Cement, three to four. Lighting in the US is 60, and so on and so forth. So the big question then becomes ESG compliance. Really, that's what it really comes down to. ESG compliance. How can we get this number right here to where these big institutions, which everybody's so hung up on to come into the space? I'm not a I'd like them to. It's not a like I would would hate them, but just remember that once the institutions come in and they more than they come in. Uh, they're not here to, ch you know, change the world. They're there to change their bank account, really. That's what it comes down to. And, of course, with ESG compliance, this is a thing that's been harped on by Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful. He talks about how, you know, Bitcoin and, and the ESG compliance issue, and they should really go to renewable energy sources. And when that happens, then, of course, more institutions will come in because they can put on their balance sheet and so on and so forth. And I think it could. I mean, why couldn't, if we have uh, an industry that's almost uh, half a trillion dollars, just in Bitcoin alone, don't you think that they'd want to be competitive and actually be a part of this? So if they have to install, I don't know, solar panels, wind sources, and other different uh, things to, to make them profitable, don't you think they would do that to move forward and then everybody could be happy? You could have this whole narrative of ESG, all the narratives that's, that's coming out by the White House where they want to be energy independent. I think it makes a lot of sense. And then there was also this. This was an interesting piece that I had, uh, had retweeted on September 7th. It's about geothermal energy. And there's just more options. There's more options than nuclear power and solar and wind and hydro. And there's a big problem with hydro, hydroelectric power as we, as we see more droughts coming up. But just take a listen to this and uh, just tell me if, you know, this could not be a part of reducing uh, the Bitcoin or the, the consumption of power. And again, it's not that Bitcoin consumes so much, but if they can actually, if the mining operations can actually make it through these different types of power, so much the better. Then they can put it back on the grid. So just take a look, listen to this, about two minutes or so. Let me stop the screen. Let me share the tab so you can actually hear it. And listen to this. California is bracing for a historic heat wave. 
Texas is suffering through what may be the hottest summer on record. New technology in housing aims to make homes more weather resilient and more environmentally friendly. Diana Olick joins us from just outside Austin with a look at some of those technologies and how they're being implemented. Hi, Diana. Hi, Contessa. Yeah, I'm standing on top of the largest ever residential geothermal grid. Every home in this 2000 acre development will be heated and cooled by the system, which is powered by solar. So if you just travel down below your feet, 30 to 40 feet, it's a constant temperature all year round, 72 to 74 degrees. So we want to access that because that makes the heating and cooling equipment all the more efficient. EcoSmart Systems, a subsidiary of developer Taurus Investment Holdings, pumps water deep underground to access that mild temperature through the water. And these are the pumps that are used to distribute the water throughout the entire geogrid. A geogrid that will eventually heat and cool more than 7,000 homes. Before any construction, boreholes about 300 feet deep are drilled in front of every lot to circulate the temperate water to each home. Thurman Homes is one of the builders. With the investment of a geothermal, the day you move in, it's going to be saving you money. Just ask homeowner Jennifer Abamonti. We essentially have no power bills at this point. The cost of a home here is about $10,000 more than a comparable home, but buyers seem willing to pay and add features like a battery backup. It's been really nice when we've had even minor outages to not have to worry about things continuing to function. And the recently passed uh, Inflation Reduction Act is a massive windfall for commercial geothermal development, tripling the tax credits. The government backing also gives investors that essential certainty that they need to push this technology to a much larger scale. Does it make sense? I mean, look, that's just one of many different options that are out there. So when I took a look at that, I'm like, well, first of all, when the reporter, she came out and she said, uh, <laughs> she said it was it was powered by solar. I'm like, what? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but geothermal, as I understand it, uh, is a form of energy conversion in which energy from within the earth is captured and harnessed for cooking, bathing, space heating, and electrical power generation. As I understand it, uh, the deeper you go into the earth, it gets a little bit hotter. So that's the whole thing with geothermal. I don't know where that solar panel or the, uh, the, the solar comet came from the uh, reporter, but I just wanted to clarify that. And then if we take a look, as far as like pricing and things like that, this was from Climate Reality or Climate Reality Project. It talks about how will I really save money with a geothermal system? And this is going a little off topic as we take a look at our, our friends in Europe. Uh, homeowners save 30 to 70% on heating and 20 to 50% on cooling costs by using geothermal heat pumps compared to other conventional systems. This translates to roughly $400 to $1,500 annual savings. And this, was, this report was uh, four years ago. You could recoup the cost of your geothermal system install installation through energy savings in as little as five years or as many as 15 or 16. And if you are in Europe and you are paying 10x the price for nat natural gas, whatever electricity source that you're using, especially as winter is coming, maybe this would have been the answer retrospectively. Of course, you know, taking a look at everything, hindsight is 2020. Uh, especially if we take a look at the governments. But when we take a look at all the things we just talked about, would this not, would this not hit the requirements of what this talked about in the report? The, fo the report focuses primarily on establishing standards for crypto miners and recommends several measures to limit the energy consumption of proof of work mining. We'll just create more electricity. If they can do that, especially what we just saw, I think it would make a lot of sense. Anyhow. That's what we have uh, for that report. Let me just think about that in the comment section. That was a little bit longer. Wow, that's way too long. Sorry. And uh, let's go on to our next piece, sharp ratio and risk assessment. So real quick, in our industry here, it's uh, a little bit risky. Let's be honest. It's a little volatile, and that's just uh, what it is. But there is this thing called the sharp ratio. It measures the profit of investment that exceeds the risk-free rate per unit of standard deviation. It's calculated by taking the return of the investment, subtracting the risk-free rate and dividing this result by the investment's standard deviation. And I think it's important because it's all about risk versus reward, and especially what we're getting into. So like, let's be honest, this is not financial advice, but in crypto and digital assets, it's a pretty risky uh, sector of investing, right? So if we could kind of minimize that, I think it's a little bit important 
I think. And that's why, like I'm always talking about, of course, diversification. I don't just invest into crypto. Also a little bit of stocks, mostly lands and, and, uh, and real estate though. 10% uh, goes to the Amazon business. I also do staking, I trust capital. And of course, yes, Masterworks, uh, which is a sponsor of the show. Uh, now you don't have to use any of the affiliate links that I have, but uh, if you do, you get to skip a wait list. And of course, the things I talk about on the show, I have skin in the game. I've got two fractionalized shares of two great artists, Banksy and a Basquiat. And so far, I'm up 40% of the Basquiat for the year. So again, when something goes up, or when something goes down, you want something else to go up. That's kind of how I look at my portfolio. And to help us out with this, the sharp ratio, I invited uh, Alan Suk Sukolitsky, the chief investment, I nailed it, chief investment officer at Masterworks. And the reason was because I kept getting these emails for different offers, and it kept talking about the numbers of sharp ratio, 0 0.94 versus all art mark of 0 0.48 and 0 0.55. I want to know what the heck that was talking about. And then I wanted to talk about the performance to date, because I got to tell you right now, Masterworks is uh, beating traditional finance and it's crushing crypto. And then lastly, I want to talk about safety, because we've been kind of rug pulled lately in crypto. So I want to ask, why did they, what's the whole point with their securities and actually registering through with the SEC? So without further ado, this is a uh, quick, quick interview, about nine minutes or so with Alan, and uh, I'll let him explain all those things. Somebody has promised I brought somebody in who could uh, help us give a little more light to what's going on with Masterworks. Uh, Alan, uh, Chief Investment Officer, thanks for, thanks for coming to the show. We appreciate it. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, Alan, I've been using Masterworks now for uh, nine months or so. Uh, my first one, I, got a, I picked up a Banksy, so I'm pretty happy about that. And, uh, and there's another one. And I will tell you this, I know nothing about art. So I want to say thank you so much for you guys and all the, <laughs> the information that you guys bring to the table. Yeah. It helps me tremendously. Great yes. to hear. So yeah, the Basque, yeah, that's what it was. So there's a couple of questions I have. First of all, I've been seeing some interesting data that you guys put out. And it looks like the risk to reward ratio. And especially in our market, we are extremely volatile and it's important that we understand the risk to reward. So we'll talk, if you could talk about that and also, uh, how are the metrics looking over there at Masterworks? How are everything's growing and whatnot? And then also the big one, I think, and I get this a lot, is, is safety and trust. In our market, uh, there's a bit of uh, difficulty with that. So I want to see how we, we are hedging against that over there at Masterworks. So the first one, Alan, explain to us as, as far as like the risk reward, because uh, what I saw when I saw this email, I was like, that's pretty interesting when we yeah. had to take a look at the uh, uh, this offering of 0 0.94 versus all market 0 0.4 and 0 0.55. So what is all this? Yeah, so what, what we've done is we basically, we've introduced this metric um, for investors in, in the traditional world of finance, which actually is the world that I come from. That's where my mm -hmm. career uh, uh, pretty much spent most of its time. There's something called a sharp ratio. And the sharp ratio, what it does is it basically measures an investment's return or how well or how poorly it's done relative to how much risk that investment actually had. And if you think about that, I mean, sometimes I use the following phrase, I call it, you know, it's sort of like a measure of bang for the buck in a lot uh -huh. of ways, right? Okay. So it's, it's easy to look at an investment's return, right? Did it go up or down or stay flat or whatever the case may be, but it's a little bit more nuanced and, it, and it's often a lot more informative to use something like a sharp ratio because it tells you, okay, we know how well or how poorly the investment did, but how about how much risk did I need to actually take to get that performance, right? So in other words, maybe you got a really attractive return, but maybe you also had to take an extraordinary amount of risk to get that return, right? That, that's, that's the type of information you would want to know, how much risk you have to take to potentially get that return that you're getting. So we've introduced the sharp ratio uh, for a lot of the uh, uh, the different artist markets that we track, uh, and we basically compare it to the sharp ratio that the S and P 500 has generated, uh, okay. and then we compare it to the S and P uh, excuse me the sharp ratio for the overall art market uh, uh, as a whole. And so, yeah. what what we like about this metric, what we think helps investors understand is with a lot of individual artist markets, you can actually get very attractive sharp ratios in terms of their performance. And, you know, I'll give you one, uh, 
uh, one simple example. So I, I mentioned I come from the traditional world of uh, uh, investment management. You right. know, I can tell you that there are a lot of professional hedge funds all over the world who would love to consistently hire traders whose strategies can generate sharp ratios of close to two. Yeah. And yet, believe it or not, there are actually quite a few artist markets that have been generating sharp ratios of close to two. It's just one of those interesting things where most investors probably have never even thought about a sharp ratio for an artist market. And so we're providing that information to say that a lot of these artist markets are actually quite attractive. I, I gotcha. So, and then when I took a look at this email and I had to, I had to email Jack over there at Mass. And I said, Hey, is this right? Because 0 0.94 seems pretty high. He's like, yeah. yeah. And he goes, we've also had one at 1.38 and I think a 1.4 somewhere on there as and, opposed and to also even some that are higher than that, by the way, that's, that's insane. And yeah. then, so this is great. Uh, when I took a look at this, I had to actually reach out to you guys. So I'm glad you're here to explain it to us. Yep. So the next thing would be then is, uh, Let's talk a, lot, a little bit about some metrics, which show the direction of where Masterworks is going. Because I have to tell you, uh, there's a little piece of information I usually talk about, which is the performance. And then yeah. year to date, I got to tell you, in traditional finance and even in uh, our market in crypto, you guys are kind of crushing it. 15% compared to the, to the negative red numbers. So what other metrics is Masterworks looking at as far as growth and how they're doing? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the performance since we started the business and uh, that we had the first offering close in September 2019, all the way through this June, performance has definitely been attractive. Um, I've uh, I've actually put on my my old traditional investment management hat and I've looked <laughs> at the performance, not, uh, you know, not just of the asset classes that uh, that you showed there, but even more on top of that. Um, you could look at uh, private equity, you could look at hedge funds, you know, th there are a lot of other asset classes you can add. And the truth is, our performance since inception has basically eclipsed pretty much all of them. Um, so on a performance basis, we, we have been doing quite well in terms of the business itself. And, and I think those two things, of course, often go hand in hand, right? If we've been mm -hmm. demonstrating since inception that we can generate attractive performance, it usually means that uh, a lot more of the investor community is becoming interested in our business. So um, it's it's one of these things where I find that anytime I, uh, uh, I'm invited to do uh, an interview or a presentation, I'm constantly having to look up what are our latest numbers for the amount of registered users we actually have on our platform because those numbers are growing all the time. Uh, the latest numbers I can tell you, we now have more than half a million registered users on our platform. Uh, those numbers are basically growing by the thousands. It seems like every uh, day that goes by. Um, at this point, we've now we brought north of 130 paintings uh, to the platform to make available to investors. Uh, that's totaling roughly 600 million dollars. So basically, the you know the the business continues to uh, to chug along quite well. We're we're you know broadening our outreach. There are a lot more uh, investors that are becoming interested in Masterworks and. You know, it's one of these things where we get the question sometimes, you know, given all of the challenges that are being faced in pretty much every other asset class this year, yeah. how is that impacting your business? And my answer is, you know, it's one of those things where if we were an asset class that was actually highly correlated to all of those other markets, then it probably would have a pretty negative impact on our business. <laughs> but at the same time, I think more and more investors are starting to realize, wait, after the last several years and everything that Masterworks has demonstrated, it actually does look like the art market is in fact not correlated to any other major asset class. So we're getting a lot of interest uh, even in the current market environment. Oh yeah, and I can tell you, I mean, even just just for, for myself, me, myself and I, I mean, yeah. I had that, uh, the Bass Yacht and it was done, I think we're up almost uh, 40% since I purchased uh, in uh, two, October 2021. So coming up on uh, roughly a year now. Yep. So, so not too shabby. And then, I mean, just like what you talked about, if we're going to talk about portfolio and balance, I mean, it really just comes down to the balance. When something goes down, you want something else to go up and vice yep. versa. It's really about diversification and just getting out there. Because if you just have all your eggs in one basket, I think it's a recipe for disaster. I, I could not agree more. Um, we, we are very big on building diversified portfolios. Um, at any point in time, if you go to our website at masterworks.io, uh, you can see 
a number of different investments that we have on offer. And to be honest, it seems like every week we're basically bringing more and more new investments to the platform. So we strongly encourage investors to always consider diversifying their portfolios. It's not any different from uh, the conversations that investor might have with a financial advisor or if they're managing their own portfolio, you know, the same way that you probably don't want one stock to represent the entirety of your equity allocation, you probably should diversify that into at least several stocks, if not more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the exact same story in the art market. Um, and so the, the one thing that I'll, uh, I'll share is that, you know, the, the thing about our acquisitions team, which basically their, their backgrounds are from the major auction houses, the galleries, the dealers. I mean, they've been involved right. in the art market for decades at this point, as you might imagine for a company that's making art investable. So <laughs> all of the artworks that we bring to market, ultimately that the acquisitions team is interested in acquiring, these are works of art that have, that have passed our pretty extensive and rigorous quantitative metrics process that we utilize up front to determine who are the artists that we want to be investing in and who are the artists that we absolutely do not want to be investing in. So I say this all as a way, you know, sometimes when investors come to the website, they might see five to 10 paintings that are on offer. They're trying right. to figure out, well, is this one attractive? Is that one attractive? Everything I just said is basically my attempt at saying any painting that makes it through our screening process and onto the platform is by by definition for us should be an attractive investment opportunity. Gotcha. And then just to just to bring it home, uh, this is not a, a get rich quick overnight type of thing. We're no. talking about holding on to these fractionalized shares of these fine art pieces for for quite some time. But that's really what it comes down to, right? Yep, it's uh, it's definitely not an overnight get rich quick scheme. Um, it's probably the farthest thing from that. The the anticipated holding period uh, for any of the paintings that we make available is let's say roughly three to seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a multi-year hold. We we right. always are very upfront and clear about that to investors. And it's one of these things where. You know, the the performance that we've been generating and the performance of the art market overall, mm -hmm. it is quite attractive. And so it's one of these things where you have to realize if you're interested in having that type of performance, you have to be fully aware going in that this is something you're going to have to give a few years to that. That's sort of the way it works to invest in the art market. Now, mm -hmm. to be fair, um, we actually have sold, the truth is, most of our paintings in less than three years, but it's that's more an example of how right. we do act opportunistically if we think it's appropriate. If we get a very attractive offer for a painting that we have, it's one of these things where if it's that attractive, we might very seriously consider selling it, even if it's under the three-year mark. But once again, I want to emphasize the typical hold period is three to seven years, and we want to make sure that our West investors are fully aware of that going in. Right. You know what? Well, you're, you're preaching the choir because on this channel, we talk a lot about, about this. It's, it's a buy and hold. It's a dollar cost average. It's the long haul. If you're yep. here for six months, it's going to be very difficult. If you have a three, five, 10 year time horizon, things tend to work out. Uh, with a little bit of time. Yeah, I, I often like to use the phrase, it, it's about time in the market, not timing the market. Right now, everybody, I guarantee you, everybody who is watching this video is laughing because I see that all the time on this channel. Oh, really? Okay. Alan, yeah, perfect. So you know what? So 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 we, 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 we've reached on some pretty good subjects. Let's talk about the last one. And I think this is probably the most important, safety and trust. Yeah. In our market, we've had a lot of different issues that have come up. We've had a lot of rug pulls, a lot of insolvency. So with Masterworks, how do we keep this safe and why should we trust Masterworks? Yeah, I mean, you know, what, what I would say is, in all honesty, the art market historically has not always been the most transparent. Hmm. Um, that's just sort of a statement of fact. And when we started the business and we were trying to figure out what's the best way that we can offer paintings for uh, investors, we ultimately decided to take the securitization route, which meant filing every one of our paintings as an offering with the SEC. Now, the reason that we chose to do this is precisely because it would bring an extraordinary amount of transparency to the, to a market that, as I just said, has not historically always been known for having the most amount of transparency. And so 
every one of our offerings, literally every one, if you go on our website, there is a link to the SEC filing on the SEC's website. And I often like to joke, if you want to become an expert on any particular artist or particular painting by an artist, go to that SEC filing that we have for that particular painting or that artist, and you will get a hundred some odd page document giving you an extensive background on that artist, on that painting. It'll give you provenance information, which means who owned it before us, who owned it before that person. We are trying to bring an extraordinary amount of transparency to this market. And we think that ultimately that helps, it goes a long way to build trust with, uh, with our investors. Excellent. Alan, I can't thank you enough for coming on to explain these things. This is uh, important for the investor, the people out there. Now, this is not financial advice. This is just uh, basic information, just passing along. Yep. But if you're looking for more information, there is a link in the description. It looks just like this. And we can go over everything that we just talked about. And also, we did a deep dive and also a affiliate link that could take you right to Masterworks. So, Alan, thanks so much for stopping by, my friend. Well, we Excellent. appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Talk soon. All right. So uh, thanks again, Alan, for stopping by. I do appreciate it. And I'll answer everybody's questions in the, in the Q&A. I see a lot of spicy things coming up. And that will do it for that piece. And now let's do a giveaway. I think this is everybody's uh, favorite part. So a couple of days ago, days ago, I think it was, we had the team from D's and ladies come on uh, for the NFT project. And I, I said, hey, if you guys would be so kind uh, to go to this tweet and do three things. Follow News Asset, follow D's NFT, and uh, retweet uh, the tweet itself, and then we'll draw some winners. I forgot to do that yesterday because well, I was on the DCA show. So let's do it right now. huh? And uh, to make sure this is uh, fair, uh, we'll, do, we'll, we'll use uh, uh, Twitter Picker. And just so you know that the floor right now for this NFT project, you're looking at 0 0.08 ETH, which is about 120, 150 bucks, somewhere around there. So we're going to be giving away four of this project. So first things first, I need the tweet URL. Hang with me. I can do this. All right. And let's load the tweet. And there it is. Okay. So the winner is going to be four, two, three, four. And the profile must have a picture. Sorry, you got to have a picture. Tweet count, account age, you got to be over one month. And the latest tweet should be about at least 30 days. I don't want to give this away to bots because that's essentially what is mostly full of uh, on Twitter. Click continue. Da, 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 da. Okay. So this is everybody who's eligible. Uh, wow. 187. That's a lot of people. So, okay. Click continue. All right. So status pending. So we'll begin the draw right now. And uh, wow, look at that. Oh, two got rejected for whatever reason. Sorry, Alex and Steven, Michael. I don't know why I did that, but it did. So congratulations to Bunky Bunch, Pepo, Luis Salguero, and Michael Peters Peterson. Excellent. Let me take a screenshot of this so I can... Uh... So all you guys got to do is uh, reach out to me on Twitter, at News Asset. You already have an account, I can tell. Uh, reach out to me and say, hey, I was the winner. And we'll verify that with your with your Twitter account. And we'll give you the information as to how to redeem your NFTs. So that will take care of our empty giveaway. Now let's get into a little Q&A. So look, I know that took, for some reason, that took quite a lot of time. I don't know what the heck happened. So sorry about that. But it's Saturday. So if you got to take off, I understand and get out of here. I appreciate you stopping by. I really do. If you like today's video, thumbs up, subscribe, all that good stuff. But now let's get into the Q&A. A lot of, I know there's a lot of questions about Masterworks and, of course, about electricity usage. So let's just jump right in, huh? All right. Q and A. Let me get out of this banner. 